everyone so this video is actually going to be all about OTCast and learning how to navigate the site I know when I applied the first time that's what took up a lot of my time was just learning how to use it and the time spans of what certain things um, took and how long those processes took as well as learning what things I could knock out first as opposed to other aspects that could wait until later so what I decided to do was since I still have access to my old OTCast account was give y'all kind of a walk through over what it looks like as well as give you suggestions on what you can tackle first and what can wait. So what I plan to do is I just kind of want to turn the camera around because I don't know how to you know pop computer screens up and things like that. Um, so I'm going to kind of do it the old-fashioned way. So I'm going to turn the uh, camera around and you'll see my computer screen and hopefully it's good enough quality for you to at least gain some information um, about OTCAS on. So bear with me and if you have any further questions after the video or if you feel like I left something out, definitely leave me a comment. You can also reach out to me if you have questions that I didn't go over through my Instagram. You can either private message me or email me as well. So we're going to get started and yeah, hopefully you can take away some helpful tips. Okay, so we are here at the main page of OTCAS where you will typically either register as a new applicant or sign in to your application profile. As I mentioned before, the first day to access the new application is July 18th, 2019, and that is for the 2019-2020 application cycle. Typically, they keep the applications open until late June <laughs> late June or early July because there are some overlapping programs that do have really late or early due dates so that's why I'm still able to access my OTCAS account and I figured that since a lot of you don't know what the portal looks like inside and a lot of time goes into just learning how to do things, I figured that I would go in and um, give y'all kind of an insight of what that looks like. If you ever see any of these post-its here, that's just because there's some personal information that I need to keep confidential, so that's what that is. But other than that, let's go ahead and log in and we'll get started. We are logged in to the application portal and right off the bat, you will notice that you'll have four main tabs, okay? So one tab being my application, the next add program, submit application, and check status. What I have hidden up here is what will be your name and your OTCAS ID number. Sometimes if you submit su supplemental applications, um, they will ask for that OTCAS ID number. So that's where you can locate that is there at the top. Typically for new applicants, you won't have this. Of course, you'll have a new application that you'll have to fill out yourself. However, if you are an existing applicant, you can transfer all of your information if it remains the same and if it's still valid. And that's what this update my application is for the next cycle if you weren't to get accepted. So I'm not gonna show you that, but let's get started and let's look into the four main components. The four main components on the main page is your personal information, academic history, supporting information, and program materials. So of course, the numbers below are the sections that need to be completed in each component. And this number down here in the program materials will always vary depending on how many schools you want to apply to. And we'll get into that more in detail later on in the video. But first, I want to kind of show you what each subsection looks like. So let's go into personal information first. This is what the personal information tab looks like. Of course, I can't go in it just because it's my personal confidential information. But this typically is something that you can knock out re really fast. Um, and there's no verification on any of these tabs to where like you have to wait for OTCast to verify anything. So that's something that you can knock out. And we're gonna just click out of this and go more in depth over some of the more important things. So 
we'll go to academic history next. So for academic history, you'll have to enter in your high school information, your colleges, transcripts, and your standardized tests, or in most cases, your GRE. Um, I haven't run into any programs that require anything else other than the GRE, but yeah, so I just kind of wanted to let you know. Um, you'll have to enter in whether you got your diploma or GED and all of your high school information here, but we're going to go ahead and click open the colleges tab. And so this is very important. If you are using a prereq that you used at either a major university or community college, it has to be listed here. So for example, I went to community college first and I actually did a summer course at a different community college. So that's why I have a total of three colleges listed. So even though I only took one course one summer, I still have to list it, okay? And you'll have the option to, you know, say that you just earned a credit rather than graduating. However, most of the prereqs that I needed came from my university, which was Texas State. And, you know, of course, I said that I earned my degree in 2017, and that's where you have to list it. So, like I said, any prereq that you plan on using to apply to OT school, that college must be listed here. Next is transcript entry, and this is something that will definitely take up a lot of your time. So this is a aspect that you can control depending on how good you are at entering your courses. So not only will you have to submit and send your transcript to OTCast, you will still need a copy yourself if you plan to review and finalize your transcripts um, yourself manually. So for example, once you send your transcripts to OTCAS, they will verify that they got it. However, you will need to review and finalize your own transcripts and you will have to go in yourself and manually enter all of the prereqs or courses that you took. Okay, now this can get very tricky and very tedious, and if this isn't done correctly, you can actually miss a due date because the application will be bounced back to you. I had that happen to me before and I was freaking out. So one thing that you see here um, is a transcript entry help video, which is helpful. However, there is also something that they offer that it's not currently listed here, but they offer a professional transcript entry. And when I applied both times, it was about $75. Now I know $75 is a lot to some people. However, if you feel the need to just go ahead and invest in that, I would highly, highly suggest that you do just because it takes a lot of weight off of your shoulders and it leaves it up to the OT cast um, experts, if you say, or the professionals to where you know for a fact that your course is entered the way that it needs to be entered. Um, that definitely helped me my second time around. My first time around, uh, I decided to forego the transcript entry or the professional transcript entry and like I said my application got bounced back the second time I went ahead and I did it and it saved me a lot of time and a lot of headaches so definitely look into it, um, investing in that professional transcript entry and just go ahead and pay the fee but other than that like I said if you plan on using a prereq from any college it has to be listed here and one more time, you will need to send the transcript to OTCast themselves. I'll try to find a link or the actual address and link it in the description box below. And you will need a copy of your transcript as well if you plan to enter your transcript in manually. So yeah, other than that, let's move on to standardized tests. Okay, so under the standardized test tab is where you will enter in your GRE scores. Like I mentioned before, I've never run into a program that requires anything other than the GRE. Um, I do know some don't require the GRE, but like, I don't know, for example, why they have the ACT or the MAT here, SAT, I have no idea. And I can't actually get into the GRE tab, but I can kind of like click on the SAT and it should be similar. So have you taken the test, yes or no? If you clicked yes, um, 
what day did you take it and you will simply put in the date that you took the test and down here this will be different of course um, where you can put in your verbal quantitative and writing scores and you can just hit submit like that so that's where you will essentially do your GRE scores is through here the supporting information tab is where you will spend a lot of your time as well this is where you will enter in your let, uh, letters of rec or your evaluations as well as your observation hours, experiences, achievements, license and certifications, documents, etc. Okay, so I've actually got a couple of questions on how to submit letter of recommendations and this is how you do it. Like I said, I'm going to have to cover up my evaluator's personal information, but I'll try to do my best to give you an insight of what it looks like. I kind of have the screen blown up a little bit just so I can carve out what you just need to know and protect some of the other information, but typically you'll need at least three letters of rec. I would suggest at least one to two being from OTs that you've observed and then the other one being from either an employer or a community organizer if you do any volunteer work, um, but you'll need at least three. and. For my cycle, we had a maximum of five, okay? So, like it says, these are electronic evaluations. So, what you will need is your evaluator's first name, last name, and most importantly, an email address that they check regularly, okay? Because since this is an electronic submission, the link where, where your evaluator will submit the le letter of rec will be sent in their email. So it says um, to make sure that you keep in regular contact with your evaluator and then once you enter in all of their information and their email, the link will be sent to their email, but if it doesn't appear in their inbox, to make sure to let them know that it may have ended up in a spam or junk folder, okay? So err on the side of caution and like I said, as soon as you plan to send that link out or um, enter them in, let them know so that they can uh, be on the lookout for that link. So once they receive that link and once they write your letter of recommendation, they will submit it through that link and it will come back with a status of completed and whether they submitted it, okay? I believe it also, I'm trying to remember if it let you know if it was still in progress or not. I'm not sure, but I have a feeling that it will let you know at least if they accepted the link and they found it, just so you kind of have feedback on your end. So yeah, that's what that looks like. And you will go in and have to enter in all of their information. Also, be sure to ask your OTs for their license number because I believe sometimes your letters of rec will ask you for the OT's license number. So make sure you get that as well. Okay, so this was another question I got on Instagram as well is concerning observation hours. So here's the thing, you will enter in your observation hours two different ways. You will enter them in manually here in the observation hours tab. And let me click into it. It'll be broken down into um, the dates, uh, whether this was paid, so if you worked there or if you just volunteered, I don't know, for both. I'm assuming like if you were a volunteer but then you became an employee there. Uh, I know that happened a lot during my undergrad, but this was kind of the confusing part that I kind of wanted to give y'all a look at was, so for example, I did, my hours or these hours specifically at an outpatient pediatric clinic so i would scroll down here and let me see if i can zoom in a little bit more so here um i did a total of 100 hours okay and it or i decided to break mine up being 50 percent um children and youth so I did 50 hours and then rehab 50 hours obviously it was a 
pediatric rehab clinic. So I just decided to split my hours like that. Of course, um, health and wellness, I could have put some right here. And so these hours could have varied, but I just kind of wanted to make it a little easier on myself and split it half and half. So definitely think and reflect about the clinic that you completed your hours in and as long as this totals up to the same amount of hours that you did then you should be okay and i'll scroll down here of course what did i see or observe general orthopedic pediatrics some sports and other so uh, yeah that's what that looks like so i went ahead and i jumped down to the documents tab because this also goes along with your observation hours. As I said, you would have to enter them in manually under the observation hour tab, but this is where you upload the actual scanned version of those hours. Now these hours have to be signed by an occupational therapist, so make sure that you have that signature, otherwise they will not be accepted. Other than that, this is where you will enter in your personal statement and OTCAS will give you a general prompt when you um, apply for the new cycle. So I want to try to do a specific video on how to tackle the general statement, but this is where you will submit it as well. You, you will just upload it as a Word document and you will submit it through here. So let's go back up and we'll talk about experiences. Under the experience tab, you will typically have the option to put in anything that you feel relevant to your application, whether it be employment, extracurricular activities, healthcare experience, internships or clinical experiences, research, teaching, volunteer or leadership experience. Uh, for mine, I did some of my employment. Um, at the moment, I plan to go into pediatrics. So. I worked with kids a lot, whether it be coaching, um, I was a special education aide at an elementary school, so that's something that I entered in here. During my undergrad, I was in a service sorority, so I put that in as an extracurricular activity. Uh, leadership experience, if I was a chair or co-chair of a certain committee during my undergrad, I would list it here. Also, go ahead and list your volunteer experience at any clinic that's also valid here um i know a couple people do research not a whole lot during undergrad but if you did research at any point and you feel like it's valid then there um and yeah other than that that's it so we'll go on to the achievements tab when you add your achievements you can typically list whether it be awards, honors, presentations, or publications, and a brief description of what it was when it was issued and the organization that presented it to you. And yeah, so whether you made Dean's List, if you graduated with honors, if you were in a community service organization and got an award, this is where you would list all of that to kind of give your application a little bit more I don't know, is it like meat or sparkle, whatever, but that's where you will do that. Okay, so for license and certifications, I didn't have that many, but I know uh, there are some people who either went into education and so they have a teaching license or um, they were originally like a patient care tech or a LVN or, you know, things like that. So if it's relevant you can also list it here like i said um i was a special education aide so that's where i listed that certification here but if you don't have any that's okay this is just kind of for those who feel like they need to list it but yeah so let's go on to oh i already showed you the documents and this is just a release statement saying that um everything you put in here is 100 percent true and you'll just sign it but other than that we'll click out of it and go back to the main hub and we're gonna go into program materials next so let's see okay so like i mentioned these sections will be determined by how many programs you plan to apply to. So this is where you get a list of all of your programs. And when you click into each one, it will have specific information on the 
program itself. So for example, let's go in under, let me see. So for example, Texas Women's, um, here is their homepage and it has a lot of the information that you will find on their website. And let me see all of the prereqs, their GRE codes. So if you are going to fill out kind of like a profile of each school, this is a good place to make sure that you have everything that you need. Your GRE code, where you can send your GRE, um, whether or not you actually have each prereq. And if it will be accepted. Let me see what else. Um, sometimes they'll talk about interviews and when they would be, sometimes not. And then here's all the information down below. Let me see. So when you click over to the document, sometimes they will ask for, let me see. This one doesn't have any. Um, sometimes in this document tab, they'll ask for like a resume. So that's where you will definitely, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. That's where you will input your resume is through this documents tab here. Some schools require it, some schools don't, but it's definitely something that you will need on hand. So if you don't already have a current resume, go ahead and start creating one. And yeah, so let's go over to prereqs. So prereqs, I'm trying to see without revealing too much. So yeah, that's gonna be it. So whether or not your course is accepted this is where you will find everything that that program requires and you will then match which prereq um you will want to satisfy that program's need if that makes sense so you have the control in that sense to say well this is my stats course and then you will enter it and then you'll go on to the next one this is the credit that i want to use for amp you know so far um that's all i can kind of show you but it's kind of just like a matching matching whichever you kind of want to do but we're going to go over to the questions tab because here is one of the supplemental applications that they required or like a statement of interest and like i said it's located under the questions tab and you will just write like a short essay and you will input it here okay so that's another place that you will also have additional essays so budget your time wisely because not only will you have a general OT cast personal statement but more than likely you will also have other essays as well so I'm gonna actually show you the Submit application tab next. Okay guys, almost done. So I went ahead and I went under the submit application tab and this is where you'll find all of your programs listed um, in order of their due dates, okay? So I'll go ahead and I'll talk about total fees. Um, you can definitely submit one application at a time. So typically they'll have a submit application and you can just submit per application that you want to go ahead and turn in without hitting the submit all. I personally never use the submit all only because I kept all of my schools in one tab so I could kind of have a timeline of when what school was due. So, for example, two of the programs that I applied to were in Indiana, and they were going to let me know whether I got accepted in January. So I went ahead, and instead of paying the whole amount for every application that I was going to apply um, to, I went ahead and I waited until January to see whether or not I got accepted. So I wasn't out of that money if I actually got accepted to those two programs um, and I decided that I wanted to go there, you know, it's not like I was wasting any money. So like I said, I rarely use that submit all. So I don't know what that looks like, but I went ahead and I submitted um, individually and it was okay. So other than that, 
I wanted to kind of talk about total fees because each program will have a different amount that they require for their OTCAS application. What I found is um, it just varies, but also keep in mind that not only will you be having to pay for the OTCAS application fee, if that school requires a supplemental application, more likely than not, you will also have to pay an additional uh, supplemental application fee as well. And that usually goes through the university on their website or their link. So make sure that you do your research on where you can find those supplemental applications on their own website as well as where you need to pay those fees because a lot of times if you were to only pay one or not even complete the supplemental application and just complete the OTCAS one, um, that is not a completed profile if that makes sense. You know, they need both in order to process you fully, both the OTCAS and the supplemental application. So know your programs and do your research on what you need before going into this. So yeah, we're going to go ahead and go back to this add program tab to kind of show you what that looks like. Okay, so this is where you will go and find a list of all of the programs. Obviously, since the application cycle is closed, you will not see any schools down here, but um, I kind of wanted to show you this tab as well. So this tab you can definitely filter out by school or by location. So if you plan to stay in state, um, you can just filter out those schools wherever you are. Um, the degree levels, you know, if you definitely know that you only want to apply for a master's or if you want to try to go for a doctorate, that's where that will filter out as well. So yeah, we're going to go ahead and skip over to check status now. This is kind of your general checklist to make sure you have everything that you need. So at the top, of course, it'll have your status of your transcripts, your letters of rec, and your GRE, and whether it was received or not, okay? So for example, the transcripts, it said that all of mine arrived and that they were approved for my evaluations. Um, it'll say whether or not the evaluator uploaded them, you know, whether they were accepted and completed, and then your standardized tests, and whether or not they were accepted um, per that program. So yeah, that's what that looks like. This is another question that always gets asked every year, is this verified status? And let me see. Okay, so I'll take this for example. Um, some programs will want you verified by the application deadline and some will just require you submit it by the application deadline. So for example, if the deadline is October 1st, you will need to have had this verified status by October 1st. And that process usually takes, for me, it was about one to two weeks, but OTCAS suggests sometimes give yourself a little bit more time just because of the amount of applications going in. So if you do not have that verified status, sometimes the program will not accept your application. So if you are concerned and you can't find any information on whether or not you need to be verified by that date, or if you just need to submit your application by that date, Go ahead and just email the program director at that um, or at the program that you are interested in or give them a call. Um, it'll definitely show that you're on top of your game and you, you know you just want to make sure that you do everything correctly. Usually um, when I had any questions, when I contacted any universities, they were usually nice about answering those questions. However, for example, um, this is some or one of the programs that I never got a chance to submit. So if it's not verified, it will be listed as in progress 
or if you have already submitted the application, it will just be listed as completed. But like I said, sometimes you need that verified status, which is the next step after being completed. So definitely give yourself enough time and definitely ask questions on whether or not your program requires you being verified by the deadline or just submitting your application by the deadline. All right, so that was kind of a look inside of what the OTCAST portal looks like. Hopefully you found some helpful information to kind of make your application process a lot easier. As I always mention, um, I like to kind of lend a helping hand to people who are doing this for the first time. I definitely had a trial and error um, year of not getting in. So like I said, second time is a charm in my case. I learned a lot from my first year and it helped me get accepted my second year. And I kind of wanted to get all of the important information out there. If you or your friend is applying to OT school, um, and if y'all have any other further questions, don't ever hesitate to reach out to me and I will do my best to answer those questions. But yeah, other than that, that is it. And look out for my next video. Thanks guys. Bye.